It's hard to overstate the influence of F.A. Hayek. Having won both the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Nobel Prize in Economics, his most popular book, The Road to Serfdom, has sold over 2 million copies around the world. And as the story goes, when then-British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher went to a Conservative Party meeting where the speaker spoke about how conservatives needed to take the middle, pragmatic ground, Thatcher interrupted the speaker and reached for Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty and held it up saying, this is what we believe in, and then slammed it down on the table. Although primarily associated with the Austrian School of Economics, Hayek's influence has also been immense outside the Austrian School, with his influence on Milton Friedman of the Chicago School and his longtime friend Karl Popper. However, Hayek didn't just restrict himself to economics. He famously devoted much of his life to expanding his work in economics to the realm of political philosophy, which is the area we are going to primarily cover in this video. Specifically, we are going to cover a 1998 article by the French philosopher and one of my favorite writers, Alain de Benoit, in his critique of Hayek's political philosophy. So we are going to spend the first part of this video talking about and describing Hayek's political ideas. While many of you might be at least somewhat familiar with Hayek's neoliberalism, minarchism, many are perhaps unfamiliar with the exact mechanics of his philosophy and how he reaches his conclusions. Then, the latter half of this video is going to be discussing Benoit's illiberal critique of Hayek's system. So to start off, Hayek asserts that throughout the history of humanity, that broadly speaking, there have been two broad political orders. The first is what he calls the constructivist order, or taxis. That is supposedly akin to the tribal order of things, which reflects primitive conditions of life that are based on solidarity, reciprocity, and group altruism. In this order, society is intentionally ordered and created top-down. This is juxtaposed to what he calls cosmos, or the spontaneous order, which is a natural order of society which has no goal to it and is not created intentionally. Since there is no larger goal to the society, every individual is allowed to pursue whichever personal goal they want. The penultimate of this order would be what Hayek calls the grand society, riffing off his close friend Karl Popper's open society. For Hayek, the grand society is not purposely instituted by men and their goals, but rather it comes about through a natural process. Hayek writes, It is the gradual selection of increasing impersonal and abstract behavioral rules, liberating individual free will while ensuring a further domestication of instinct, and drives inherited from preceding phases of social development which have permitted the coming into being of the grand society, rendering possible spontaneous coordination of the ever more widespread activities of human groups. In fact, if freedom has become a political morality, it follows from a natural selection, which means that society has gradually selected the value system responding best to the constraints of survival, which were those of the biggest number. After all, before anything, culture is memory of beneficial behavioral rules selected by the group. So Hayek has developed his own form of what we might call social Darwinism, which claims that society slowly evolve, taking what customs prove helpful and leaving those that aren't. And the end result will be or is the grand society, where nothing but economic calculation reigns, and the state is relegated to a very minimal goal of enforcing basic laws and ensuring that the rules are as abstract and universal as they possibly can be. So, for Hayek, modernity is a natural result, and each stage of human history is better than the one preceding it, since man, being the hyper-rational creature he is according to Hayek, has kept the good customs and left the bad. Just like Marx and his followers created a dialectical historical view, where slavery is replaced by feudalism, which is replaced by capitalism, which will eventually be replaced by communism, where each stage is better than the next, with communism being the most moral of all, so too, has Hayek created a similar philosophy of history where a man is constantly progressing and the end of history is the grand society. One key argument that props up much of Hayek's political philosophy is his rejection of there being a fully transparent market and that economic agents ever have complete information. For Hayek, society in the market is always changing, so people can never truly know every variable, but rather than this being a failure or limitation of capitalism and the grand society, it's actually beneficial. For if we can never have complete information, top-down societal change is impossible and will inevitably result in failure. 
So to avoid failure, it's best to rely on tradition, which is defined as habit sanctified by experience, and really let individuals pursue whatever they think is best for themselves, never imposing the will or ideas on anyone else. This signifies a shift from Anglo-Scottish classical liberalism, and hence why I described Hayek as a neoliberal minarchist. But this isn't the only shift Hayek's neoliberalism has with classical liberalism. Adam Smith, the classical liberal, argued that if all individuals were allowed to pursue their own private means and goals, then the collective will benefit from this. But Hayek takes this logic a step further, and arguably to its logical conclusion, when he asserts that individuals should merely pursue their own private interest, not because it benefits the collective good or the collective society, but because precisely there is no collective good to begin with. This reasoning stems from the idea that ultimately the market and the grand society is without goals. It lacks any teleology whatsoever. Alain de Benoit also points to a few other areas where Hayek breaks with classical liberalism, such as his belief that instead of liberal freedoms such as private property and individual rights creating markets, it's actually the opposite. It is free exchange and the market that allows for these freedoms as liberals have traditionally conceived them. Additionally, Hayek rejects the state of nature hypothesis, which served as the backbone for many liberal theorists, and opts instead for justifying his society on a natural evolution that takes place which he ascribes a moral value to and says will eventually lead to the grand society. And instead of a transcendental social contract that is supposed to exist for the humans coming out of the state of nature, this idea is replaced with market mechanisms which are supposed to integrate the entire globe into a totally depoliticized world where the laws are the same everywhere and the tentacles of the market have penetrated every quarter of the earth and have removed all rivalries and all remnants of the so-called primitive tribal past. Instead, there is a mass depoliticization in a proper Schmidtian sense where there is no friend-enemy distinction for economics has replaced all. Because the market is so universal and depersonalized with rules that apply to everyone on earth, the idea of social justice goes out the window. And here, I don't mean social justice as in the blue hair feminists screaming about men spreading their legs on public transportation, but social justice in the way the Catholic Church once understood it. Hayek has to reject social justice because ultimately the market is fair since it applies to all. Sure, some will win and some will lose the game, but everyone is equal, so all is fair and you don't get to complain. Hayek further revokes the right to complain since the grand society is allegedly unplanned and without any goals, so that you are given the short end of the stick is quite literally no one's fault but your own, since this society is spontaneous and merely the peak of human evolution. To quickly sum up this section before going into Benoit's critique, Hayek believes that the political order of what he calls the Grand Society, a truly global and depoliticized world defined by a collection of social individuals merely pursuing their own interests, is the inevitable consequence of the natural evolution of human society where traditions are tried and tested over time with the good ones being adopted and the bad ones being left in the past. Additionally, humans have limited information, so it's best we just leave individuals to their own devices and purposeful systems which seek to purposely alter society, ranging from socialism to fascism, are bound to fail precisely because they lack the proper information to change society. Now having lost over Hayek's political philosophy, we can now begin to discuss Benoit's critique of Hayek. So Benoit begins his critique of Hayek with Hayek's anthropology, or the way he views humanity. And he asks whether or not it's true that all human constructs are the result of rationalism and an intentional weighing of the pros and cons of every tradition and humans saying, yep, we're going to keep these ones and throw out those. In fact, the truth is much more complex of why humans create, maintain, and change their traditions than purely utilitarian calculus. And to see it as merely utilitarian calculus is to start off with the wrong anthropological view of humanity, and it totally ignores the role that superstition, religion, and non-rational factors come into deciding these things. Next, Benoit takes aim at Hayek's information theory. Now, while Hayek may be right that we can never have complete information, that doesn't mean it's impossible to do projects on a collective level. There are many instances where we don't have complete information, but still assume certain things and adjust as we go along. Many of the branches of science largely have to make certain assumptions in order to work, along with many other disciplines. This shows that 1. 
we don't need complete information to successfully do a collect a project, and two, that you can adjust your assumptions as you get results back. There doesn't need to be a distinction between knowledge and praxis. They can be interwoven together, and you can see if your project is being successful or if it needs to change. If humans are able to act to the best of their ability with limited knowledge at an individual level, and in fact are even applauded for doing so according to Hayek, what seems to be holding humanity back from acting with limited knowledge at a collective level? There doesn't seem to be much of an answer to this in Hayek's thought. Hayek even contradicts himself when it comes to this idea. For if intentional and collective human action should never be done, then this puts Hayek in a weird place vis-a-vis -vis his grand society, since he himself proposes several intentional collective human projects to further his grand society, such as suggesting that competing currencies be introduced. If Hayek was really true to his own ideology, then the only way for which his society should come about is through the alleged social Darwinism talked about in the beginning, where humans will naturally advance to a more advanced stage of society, with the penultimate being the grand society. As alluded to before, this predicament is akin to the Marxist dilemma of the early 20th century about how revolution is to be done since all the lines of Marx which predicted an inevitable communistic revolution in industrialized capitalist countries had never come about. The truth is, is that Hayek's utopia is very much predicated on intentional human design and to the extent that his ideal society has been realized in our own contemporary times is largely through intentional planning. Take for instance markets, which have come about thanks to the government building the massive infrastructure required for international and even national trade like highways, ports, and the laws that standardize weights and measurements. All of these were intentional designs that allowed markets to come into fruition. Although I must add a note here that this is obviously not the only thing which allowed markets and capitalism to come into effect. If capitalism is so broadly defined as when people use capital, then as Israel Lira put it, even the first human who picked up a shovel and used it would be a capitalist. But Benoit even takes this argument a step forward, and he questions the entire spontaneous versus instituted orders dichotomy, and says that it's not clear-cut at all, and there's a very intense interplay between the two. Benoit writes, the claim that formation of the social order is the result of unconscious practices independent of all goals or collective aims is simply wrong. There has never been such a society. The self-organization of society is both more complex and less spontaneous than Hayek claims. If rules and traditions influence human life, one cannot overlook, without falling into a purely linear and mechanical vision, that men in turn also affect rules and traditions. Or to quote from Eric Stryker, all societies are planned. The question is, who's doing the planning? I would like to cover how Benoit takes on Hayek's concept of social justice now. As explained earlier, Hayek rejects whole cloth the idea of social justice even existing, and equates the all-encompassing totalitarian but non-authoritarian market to a game where everyone is equal. Thus, if you lose, tough luck, but that's on you. There's no societal injustice, that's just life. And besides, no one is even in charge of the system, so you can't even point a finger to someone to even claim damages from. But Benoit questions this notion. He asks, is it imaginable to fail to improve the security of boats or planes under the pretext that no one is responsible for the nature of oceans or of space? Benoit urges us to question whether or not the game is really fair if some people consistently win while others consistently lose. If we see these systemic patterns, even if they are truly naturally occurring, then there are things that humans can do on a collective level to alleviate these societal ills and restore social justice properly understood. Now attacking his theory of social Darwinism, Benoit makes perhaps the obvious criticism of, if capitalism is so good, then why has it really only appeared in the West? Most of the world has embraced some form of durihisme, from parts of Eastern Europe and Russia, the Middle East, Latin America, most of Asia, and Africa. Hayek seems to have merely looked at the societies he grew up and lived in, America and Western Europe, and simply assumed that this is the universal model. Much the same way that liberal theoreticians created a moral system of individualism, unique only to the West, and called it human rights to proclaim its universality and defaultness. Hayek's social Darwinism is exactly that, social Darwinism. 
It's an ideology of the 19th century that works only if you deduce the world to be nothing but the USA, Britain, and Germany. Since the market hasn't replicated itself everywhere, as Hayek's theory would suggest, since humans would just realize this self-evident truth naturally, how can Hayek claim that his system is even justified since the moral force justifying his society, the natural evolution of humanity, has been shown to be a farce? One argument could be that rather than basing the justification of the grand society on the methodology that gives rise to it, his social Darwinism, rather you can give the grand society a morally intrinsic positive value. But this raises the problem that by giving it some sort of intrinsic value, you then are able to do collective action to try and achieve it, and would be no better than the system of the Marxist, the socialist, and the fascist. Similar problems arise with taking up a utilitarian defense of the grand society, asserting that it is the most effective way to organize humanity and generate wealth. For then, not only could you then justify your society on normative grounds, and thus intentionally try to reach it, and having the problems that we stated above, but you would also give people who have been losers of the game to claim damages since they have been slighted and lost wealth in a system that is supposed to be about the maximization of wealth. Benoit wraps up his essay by asking, what is Hayek's real goal, individual freedom or economic efficiency? Benoit wraps up this essay by asking, what is Hayek's real goal, individual freedom or economic efficiency? While Hayek would probably say it's both, Benoit asserts that for Hayek, in the end, the market is the ultimate end which requires freedom to maintain it. Hayek's idea of freedom is purely negative and based on the atomized individual with each individual having the exact same homogeneous freedom. So freedom is ultimately boiled down to the support of the market and humans become mere instruments to support the global marketplace. For Hayek, there are no more homo sapiens. The only thing left is the homo economicus, which shows Hayek's economic reductionism and his utilitarianism despite his protests that he's actually not a utilitarian. I find it very interesting that Benoit reaches the conclusion that I reached when I did my critique of Yaron Hozoni, in which I showed him to be nothing more than a liberal utilitarian and not the so-called nationalist he claimed to be. Overall, Benoit's essay does an amazing job of tearing apart the foundation for Hayek's political philosophy and shows that it is riddled with contradictions and that, for all Hayek's claim that his society is what natural human cultural evolution would lead to, he wants to construct a society by force and political will just as much as any fascist, socialist, or Marxist does. This, of course, is to say nothing of the actual implications of a totalitarian, capitalist society where humans are denied anything larger than their own individualism and how this truly would be a revolt against nature.